Well, good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to the worship service. Hope you're doing well today. Let's stand together, and we're going to be worshiping God with our whole heart and our whole mind, uh, loving God and just kind of reaching out to God's spirit this morning and just trusting in Christ to, um, I don't know about you, if you've ever been in a place in your life where you just kind of feel stuck or just, I don't know, things like you're, you're doing your best, but it's still things aren't working out, whatever it may be. And uh, Christ, I think, comes to us in those moments and, and helps us to break through. So we want to trust Jesus for that this morning. What are those chains that you need broken? How is it that you need to experience uh, God's redemptive power in your life today? How are you sensing the Spirit of God calling you to rise up and take up your mat and walk again? so good to sing out, to rejoice together, and just once again put our trust in Jesus. Uh, 
his love, his strength, his power together this morning. Let's take a moment to pray and just kind of once again call on the name of God and trusting that God's Spirit is here with us, uh, filling us with mercy and grace and also giving us power to live for Christ. We just welcome you, God, into this space.
we'll sing, let your spirit fall. Let your spirit fall. Let your spirit fall. Let your spirit fall. On us. Let your spirit fall. Let your spirit fall. Let your spirit fall. Let your spirit fall. God, we turn our hearts to you. Trusting in you, trusting in Jesus, trusting in the cross on which Christ died for us to show us the full extent of your love. Once again, we turn our hearts to you this morning.
at the good news church. It's so good to cry out uh, the name of Jesus, to sing out praise to God, and just to once again open our hearts to God's spirit this morning. It's a, it's a beautiful thing that you do. I just want to ask two things before you're seated. One is if you could fill out a Connect card. Uh, if you're visiting, please do that. You can stick in the offering plate a little bit later or one of the drop boxes. Also, we have our mission cards on the back table, so please stop by that table after the service and sign those cards for our mission partners. You may be seated, and I want to invite up our growth group leaders. way forward. Notice in your bulletin there's a brochure uh, that's about growth groups. I think that there's about 19 growth groups uh, that are happening either at the church or in homes or on campuses this semester. Growth groups are groups of maybe 8 to 15 people and it is an awesome way to connect in community beyond Sunday morning. I'm in three different growth groups myself with other pastors of, of different sizes and there have just been times um, when, when they've just been a lifeline to me and helped me really speak into my life. So going beyond Sunday morning into real authentic community together. So we want to ask, uh, beginning down here with Jerry, is there a microphone? I think it's, yeah, it's on. Uh, Jerry Gates, uh, Band of Brothers, Saturday mornings at 7 o'clock. We're studying Acts. Hello, good morning. I'm Lily. I'm the pastor of the Chinese ministry. And we have meetings on Friday nights, and uh, I'll let them also say a few things about the Chinese ministry. Hi, my name is Rebecca. I'm with her. Yeah, I'm Chang Xiu. Uh, we also meet every Monday evening, 7.30, uh, in the, uh, the Chinese uh, prayer meeting. I'm Caroline Demon, and I lead the women's group on Thursday mornings. We do provide childcare, but we welcome all women. Good morning, I'm Christina Mack. Um, our group is a mon uh, women's night out on Monday nights every other week at 7.30. I'm Sue Dirks, and we have a growth group Monday nights at my place at 6.30. Search the scriptures. This term we're studying the Old Testament book of Daniel. I'm Evie Hopkins, I lead the inter International Women's Group, meets at my house Sundays at 1, and we're studying Philippians. Hi, I'm Bill Morris. Um, I lead the Sunday morning group uh, at the 10 o'clock hour. Uh, we are studying Ephesians. I am Justin Alphonse. I co-lead the UMass Men's Growth Group. We meet at 7.15 on Tuesdays in the Eisenberg Building at UMass. I'm Sang Ben. I'm the other UMass Men's Growth Group leader, and we are currently we are studying Ecclesiastes. Hi, I'm Hannah Jin, and I'm the UMass Women's Growth Group Leader. Uh, we meet on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. in the Campus Center, and we're studying the Book of John. Hi, my name is Kelsey, and I'm one of the leaders for Amherst College Growth Group. Hi, I'm Daniel. I'm also one of the co-leaders of the Amherst College Growth Group. Hi, my name is Brian. I'm also one of the leaders of the Amherst College Growth Group. Uh, we're studying the Book of Nehemiah right now with the church, uh, so that's exciting. Our information can be found um, on the bulletin, including like 
time and location. Hi, my name is Sabrina M. I'm the Mount Holyoke Women's Growth Group Leader. Um, we meet on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. at Safford, and we're also studying Nehemiah with the church. Hi, my name is Anna Lee. I lead the Smith College Growth Group, and we're studying Luke. Hi, my name is Cheng. Um, we're the Young Adult Fellowship, which is a new group. We welcome all graduate students and also young working adults or professionals. Um, check out the bulletin for more information. Hi, my name is Tina and my husband Deepu. Um, we represent the Living Faith group that meet on Saturday mornings. Currently, we are learning 1 Corinthians. Hi, my name is Lucy Mole. I'm here for the African Community Group. Uh, we've been meeting once a year on Monday for the last couple of years. We are thinking of making that a little bit more frequent. And those meetings may happen on Friday. We are still in the process of thinking through the process. Uh, ours may not be a small group because we are a continent and diaspora. <laughs> so we are still thinking through that. We'll give you the dates and the day as that becomes. Awesome. Lucy, in, in your gathering a week ago, how many, uh, how many from the African continent were there? 60. 60 people. I could smell the food from my house. <laughs> all right. And by the way, you all who are studying Nehemiah, if you could study a week ahead of the church and give me the notes, that would be really helpful. Okay, anyway, no, but uh, look at this mosaic of growth group leaders who have stepped out to shepherd small groups so that those times when we have questions we've always wanted to ask, those times when we feel like we've kind of hit bottom, I wish that there were people who, who we had been transparent with when we celebrate the joys together of life. I hope that you'll connect. Rather, it's a growth group, campus ministry, a group of friends intentionally getting together, but some kind of small group that goes beyond uh, Sunday morning. So let's pray together uh, over the growth groups and these growth group leaders. Father, we give you thanks for these growth group leaders who have stepped out. They, they have uh, gone through uh, orientation and training, and you've given a sense of heart called to each one of them. Father, would you grant them your wisdom as they shepherd the people that uh, you call together into small group communities. Father, may the small groups truly be 360 degree learning together, learning from each other how your word connects with the realities of our lives. And Father, as we prepare for our Sunday morning offering, God, it is moments just like this so that people in the church are cared for that we're meeting in community that we're growing more like you and that we're reaching out and we're serving our community and the nations to shine the light of christ praise and glory and honor be to you god father son and holy spirit now and forever amen and the growth group leaders will be in the fireside lobby in the back if you want to meet them and kind of check out some of the groups so thank you awesome Turn 
every promise comes my way when i feel your hands of grace rest upon me staying desperate for you god staying humbled at your feet i will lift these hands and praise i will believe i remind myself all that you've done and the life I have because of your son love came down and rescued me love came down and set me free and I am yours I am forever yours mountain high and Good morning. I'll be reading from Nehemiah chapter 5, verses 1 to 13. That's on page 475 of our Pew Bibles. Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their Jewish brothers. Some were saying, We and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Others were saying, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our homes to get grain during the famine. Still others were saying, we have to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Although we are of the same flesh and blood as our countrymen, and though our sons are as good as theirs, yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. 
Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. When I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and officials. I told them, you are exacting usury from your own countrymen. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them and said, as far as possible, we have brought back our Jewish brothers who were sold to the Gentiles. Now you are selling your brothers only for them to be sold back to us. They kept quiet because they couldn't find nothing to say. So I continued, what you're doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of the Gentile enemies? I and my brothers and my men are also lending people money and grain, but let exacting of usury stop. Give back to them immediately their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and houses, and also the usury you're charging them, the hundredth part of the money grain, new wine, and oil. We will give it back, they said, and we will not demand anything more from them. We will do as you say. Then I summoned the priest and made the nobles and officials take an oath to do what they had promised. I also shook out the folds of my robe and said, in this way, may God shake out the, his house and possessions every man Shake out of his house and pos possessions every man who does not keep his promise. So may such a man be shaken and emptied. At the time, the whole assembly said, Amen, and praised the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. Mm. The word of the Lord. We live in a culture with a tremendous crisis of character, don't we? I don't need to tell you that. We read about it every time we log on to our favorite news site or we watch the TV news or the news feed on, on our phone. You know, it's, uh, Hollywood producers or writers who have wealth and fame, and then behind the scenes we find out that there's been sexual harassment and abuse going on for years. Or athletes who thousands of people gather to cheer and then we find out some of them, there's been domestic violence in their homes. And then they're still allowed to play. And when they play, their hometown cheers them on even more. Or corporations that have won awards for, for green design. But then we find out behind the scenes that they have been falsifying uh, pollution metrics and pouring pollution carbon into the atmosphere. It even goes to the President of the United States. Presidents who, when the mic was hot or the video was going, have said things that are misogynistic and are about sexual abuse. And it even hits home. You know, sometimes we'll look at someone's profile, Facebook, and we'll interact with them, and we realize, wow, who they're putting out is very different than the person I really know. That's the culture in which we live in. Because part of the challenge is we live in a culture where what people achieve is given so much more attention and more deeply valued than who people are. And the challenge is the kingdom of God is countercultural. It's upside down. God is much more passionate. God is much more concerned for us about who we are than what we achieve. Because the truth is God doesn't really need us to achieve anything. But God chooses uh, for us to incarnate and be part of his sovereign, uh, redemptive story of human history. But far more important is really who we are. And speaking into this challenge is Nehemiah in our journey through the book of Nehemiah. We come to chapter 5. Will you join me at page 475 in your blue Bibles, Nehemiah chapter 5. Now, in chapter 4, there were external challenges to the Hebrew people building a wall that would protect them from genocide and that would restore uh, the Messiah's lineage, hope in Messiah. And there's external challenges, you know, Sanballat and Gershom and Tobiah surrounding them. Now, when we come to chapter 5, there's internal challenges. It's like for us within the church. There was stuff happening. 
that speaks a tremendous challenge to us about who we really are. Join me in chapter 5, verse 1. Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their own Jewish brothers. We and our sons and daughters are numerous, but to eat and stay alive, we've got to have grain. Others were saying, we're mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our homes to get food during the famine. And still others were saying, we had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Notice the word now. This is a transition. Now that the wall was about halfway built, just when they had accomplished the wall at about halfway, huge accomplishment, just when they had come through these external challenges, just when they least expected it comes these temptations within the community. You know, doesn't it happen to us so often when in unexpected times challenges come? You know, it, it might be like we've decided together to, to begin to become more generous or I choose to begin to tithe and it seems like somewhere along the way that's when the car breaks down, right? Or maybe it's a couple who's dating and they've made the decision, we're going to start to really follow you know, God's covenant of how we relate together and have a Christ-centered relationship. And just then, somewhere along the way, uh, they kind of realize, man, we keep getting alone <laughs> and we're really tempted. And it seemed like before we could never get alone, right? Or maybe it's that um, someone who's wrestled with substances. And just when we think, oh, oh we've come away, then that friend messages us. And they're going out Friday night, and we know what that means. And yet there's such a, a temptation toward it. Or maybe it's that we have chosen not to be as much of a workaholic at our work because of damage to our family or to our health. Or, or we've decided to make some ethical changes to honor God at work. And it seems like around Thursday comes that memo from corporate. And that memo is going to challenge the decisions that we've made. We need to be prepared. We need to expect that when we're doing things that matter, that when we're taking steps to trust and honor and follow Christ in our own lives or as a church together, we need to expect that there are going to be challenges. And not surprise, but be ready to hit those head on. Amen? So it's amazing how, um, how this challenge arises because this community is working on the wall side by side together, and then there begin to be food shortages. Uh, farmers, many of them are helping to build the wall, because this is a crisis. They need to build this wall as quickly as possible to protect against genocide, but many of the farmers helping to build the wall means the farms aren't being managed. At the same time, there's a famine, and so you have tremendous food shortages. At the same time, some, not all, but some of the wealthy, powerful people have been lending to these impoverished people at exorbitant interest, usury, they're really making, seriously, they're making toxic subprime loans is what they're doing. And then they're foreclosing. And because of this, people are suffering so much so that some of their kids are being sold, they're being trafficked into slavery. And then the government is charging high taxes to impoverished people. And the result is injustice where there's spiraling poverty, where they're swirling in debt, and where there's human trafficking of their own children. Does that disgust us? Ooh, before we wave the finger at them. You know, sometimes I wonder, am I reading scripture or CBS News, right? It's, just, it's so contemporary because this is a lot of the life of the people who pick our fruit or weave our rugs, or sew our clothing, or assemble our gadgets. And so often we don't think about it, we don't really notice it because we live in the empire. And so often we don't really notice it, but this is from God's perspective about some of the social injustice and the abuse and the anguish that happens to real life people, seemingly in every generation. Now here's what's fascinating, Nehemiah could have kept building the wall, right? He, he could have said, you know, we're halfway there. We, we need to protect against genocide. I know there's sacrifices, but get to back to work. His best leadership speech. But here's what would have happened then. They may have achieved the vision, but when they would have completed the vision, they would have realized we're not at all the people 
who God is calling us to be. You see, we need to understand Nehemiah's vision is not about the wall. Nehemiah's vision is ultimately not building a wall. Nehemiah's vision that God has given him is to bring God's covenant people back together, to be God's people, distinctly God's people, in a shattered, broken world, to be a light to the Gentiles whose abuse they have experienced. And so he's not willing to shortcut who God's calling them to be in order to achieve what God's calling them to achieve. And so he halts the work. Look how bad it really got. Look at verse 5. <clears throat> Although we are the same flesh and blood, and our children are as good as theirs, we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we're powerless because our fields and vineyards belong to others. In verse 1, we read, against your own people, and here in verse 5, same flesh and blood. Take away value. The challenge is that when we compromise our values, when we sin against God, it damages the people who we love. In community, the, the sins of these people, the oppression that they were bringing, the abusive behavior, it was wreaking havoc and causing pain. When a husband sins, make no mistake, his wife will pay some kind of price. When parents compromise their values, the children will pay some kind of price. When an employer breaches ethics, either investors and or employees, they will pay a price. When a pastor's character begins to wander away from Christ-like character, a church will pay a price. And so it's a challenge for all of us to really ask, what's happening in my heart? Am I forming more Christ-like character? Am I allowing God's grace to bring me to genuine repentance and change within me? Because who we are is more important than what we accomplish in God's perspective. Well, in verse 6, we'll be mentored by Nehemiah's response. When I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. I pondered them in my mind. Then I accused the nobles and, and officials. I told them, you're charging your own people uh, usury or exorbitant interest. Nehemiah mentors us with his response in this. First of all, he's angry. But there's a Hebrew intensifier there. He's really very mega hyper angry. Okay, that might be a good translation. He is really angry. I pray that we never lose our passion. We never settle in. But we will become angry at the things that break God's heart. We will have a holy discontent for the things that break God's heart. Amen? But what do we do with it then? You know, when that anger arises over whatever uh, injustice or oppression is happening in our own community or, or, or among the nations, we then read that Nehemiah pondered these things in his mind. Now, here, here, here's what surprised me this week studying. The word pondered is the Hebrew word lave. That's the word for heart. Here, 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 here's what I think the passage is really saying. His heart was evoked with anger and it moved from his heart to think in his mind how he would respond. Isn't that wise? See, so often we can be passive-aggressive and in our culture, we often see passive-aggressive responses, don't we? We see this uh, kind of unleashed anger about issues, and so often that causes people who may even agree with whatever issue to kind of move back, and it's unproductive. Or we become so jaded with the issues in our world or the politics that's happening. We just become jaded, and we shut down, and we remain silent, and we don't do anything. That's not what Nehemiah does. He's angry at the injustice and so he filters through his mind. What is the wisest action I can do that might begin to make a difference, might contribute to bringing change? And then he has his thoughtful response. <clears throat> and this is what we read about in verse 8. A brilliant strategy of how he goes to the heart of this community. As far as possible, we have bought back our Jewish brothers and sisters who were sold to the Gentiles. Now you're selling your own people only for them to be sold back to us. Well, they kept quiet because they could find nothing to say. 
So since they were quiet, I just kept on going. <laughs> what, are, what you're doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? How brilliant. Rather than just giving them a, a guilt speech, you know, come on, people, would you act a little bit better? We need to build the wall, whatever. That would last a few days, right? He goes right to the heart. And he reminds them, he, 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 he talks with them about God's redemption. He reminds them, oh, remember, you were slaves in Egypt. This is a community of people who were enslaved. And God, by his grace, redeemed us out of slavery into liberty to be his people and be a light to the nations. How can you, formerly enslaved people, who know what redemption is, how can you now be selling people as slaves? Only to have people have to buy them back again. Well, this really speaks to us because we were enslaved. You and I have been enslaved by our sin or our brokenness or cultural expectations or, or the isms that we might have. And, and, and that can feel like such bondage. And yet God, in God's grace, just as real as the Hebrew people in the Exodus, God brought them out. God has set us free because of what Christ has done on the cross. See, we can't understand God's grace until we understand the depth of human depravity. Until we realize how vile our sin really is. Until we understand God's wrath against injustice that has been turned away from us and put on Christ on the cross. We're objects of God's grace. So the challenge is, how do we view those who are enslaved? Either spiritually enslaved. I can't believe people act in our culture like that. You know, most of Jesus' greatest condemnation wasn't the people around him. He knew. Of course they act like that. They're not redeemed, right? They, they don't have it. Like, like the Hebrew people knew, hey, there's equality here. We know Torah. We know God's law. That there's an equality of all people, of all children. That was vastly different from the worldview of their neighbors, where there were uh, kind of divine greater status for some people, and other people had lesser status. And they knew that's not the Torah, that's not the scripture of the true and living God that God has taught to us, where there is equality. And so, how do we view people who are either spiritually in bondage, or financially impoverished, or persecuted? Who are we to condemn when we were enslaved? Instead, we know the God of liberty who can help set people free. And for reasons I don't completely understand, wants to incarnate it and work through us. God in person, breaking chains. Amen? This is also important. Uh, and Nehemiah reminds us in verse 9 for our witness. He says, look, the way you're living, you're going to be a reproach to your enemies. Your enemies are going to look at you and they're going to say, they're, they are desecrating God's reputation. Because they're looking at how the Hebrew people are acting. And they're saying, why would we want to follow that God? I don't know about you, but, but there's a lot of people rejecting Jesus because of media images or the church not being careful with our witness, not being wise. Or some of the movements that we might attach ourselves to. And I think that there's people saying, well, that Jesus. Why would I want to have anything to do with Jesus if that's how his followers live? If that's how their followers treat other people? Wow. Well, some of the solution really... So let me just mention again... Nehemiah gets to the heart of it. He doesn't guilt them to try to just change their behavior. He goes to their heart. You are an enslaved people who've been set free. That's the heart of social justice from a Judeo-Christian perspective. We were enslaved, we've been set free, and we're called to be liberators of those who are in bondage. Amen? So, in verse 10, uh, we wrap it up, and Nehemiah has this just amazing confession that he makes. This is great leadership. I and my brothers and my men are also lending the people money and grain. But let's stop charging interest. 
Give back to them immediately their fields, vineyards, olive groves, houses, and also the interest that, that you're charging to them, the, uh, the 1% or the, um, the one hundredth of the money, grain, new wine, olive oil. And then the people respond, we will give it back. We will not demand anything more from them. We'll do as you say. What an amazing confession. This is what Nehemiah is saying. I, I've been lending too. I'm part of the problem. And he also recognized he represents the empire, the government, that in some ways has been oppressing the people. And, and he recognized we all need to make some changes here. I think what he's really saying, let's stop reflecting the values of our neighbors and come back to Torah, to, to God's truth, and reflect the values where we see the Imago Dei, we, saw, we see God as the creator of every person that we ever meet. What he's really saying to them is give back the stuff you've taken that's impoverished people. Give up the privilege that you've earned by oppressing others and grant grace that is going to be incredibly costly. Next week, we're going to go through the second half of chapter 5. And this is where Nehemiah begins to make his own costly sacrifices in order to bring justice. I know some of the college students will be away on the retreat, so I just want to say this. Sometimes we ask, what can I do to help advance justice? It, it's an excellent question. And we wait for some kind of big thing that we can be part of. I think where it really starts is, okay, spend less money. Like, oh, Greg, could you move on to something else? No, spend less money. Live a little bit simpler. We don't need all the latest stuff. Be more generous with our funds. Look at how we invest our time and invest our time in things that really matter most. And think about how am I relating to my neighbors? Do I even notice my neighbors? Do I even notice the issues going on in the world? Because remember, parable of the talents, right? To those who have been and been faithful with little, the door will be open to much more. You see, I think it really starts when we say, God, I'm, I'm willing to make sacrifices in order to honor and serve you and see your shalom advance in, in the world. And we'll unfold that a lot more next week with Nehemiah. So here, here, here's the challenge for us. Are we ready to repent? if our character has strayed away from Christ-like character. Are we ready to repent? God, I confess to you, my heart is, there's darkness and brokenness and sin. And God, would you change my heart? I confess to you, I need your grace. Nail that stuff to the cross. And are we willing to sacrifice? As if it was wartime. Because there's spiritual war going on. Are we willing to sacrifice? Help see God's shalom spread. And more people will, I sniff the fragrance of Christ. Oh, that's who God's people really are. Father, guide us in this. This is as challenging and more challenging to me than anyone else. Because like Nehemiah, my hand is up and I realize ways that I have become complacent, comfortable, and not um, passionately followed you in some different ways in my own life. Guide us, God, to be a community of people who love each other so richly that the fragrance of Christ is known. Guide us to be your hands, your feet, your voice in a broken, shattered, jaded world so the fragrance of Christ might shine. And that, God, your heart that is so broken for children you love who are in poverty, who are in spiritual darkness, who are abused, who are forgotten, who are marginalized, that will bring joy to your heart as one more of your children we loved and cared for and blessed. Guide us in this, we pray, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's stand together.
I know sometimes hearing a message, we, we look for like, what are some practical steps? What's the next step? Just help me to, to lean in. So a, a, a book recommendation is called Just Mercy. It's by Brian Stevenson. He went to the same college that our daughter Anne went to, then to Harvard Law School. And he is the founder of the Equal Justice Initiative. The work that he is doing is just tremendous to help those um, who are really oppressed in our legal system and, and other legal systems and it's his story and it really helps us walk into the shoes of someone 
who's experienced oppression and has risen to be um, really making a, a difference. Just practical ideas to help us to think about things that we can do. Uh, also, um, on the church email list, tonight will come an email uh, that will have the study guide for this if you want to use it in, in groups or for your own study. May we go out as the hands, the feet, and the voice of our Savior. Oh, how he loves us. And oh, how he longs to love through us to all peoples. Amen.